I would like to introduce our guest. Uh, it's my privilege to present our lecturer, uh, Professor Robert Spessler, uh, worldwide uh, well-known neurosurgeon and chairman of Barrow Neurosurgical Neurological Institution in Phoenix, Arizona, and professor of surgery section of neurosurgery at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, professor Spatchler is specialized in cerebrovascular diseases and skull-based tumors. Uh, uh, extremely prolific, uh, he has published more than uh, 500 articles and uh, 180 book chapters and uh, has co-edited multiple neurosurgical textbook, textbooks, including the Color Atlas of Microneurosurgery. Uh, this atlas uh, will be gifted by an author with a uh, name, signed uh, name of one of the participants of today's lecture. Uh, so, let me uh, introduce our dear guest uh, and uh, welcome again, Professor Spessler. Uh, now you can start sharing your screen and start your lecture. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the kind uh, introduction. And it is always a pleasure to be speaking um, to my colleagues uh, around the world. Uh, this is this is an unusual topic because it's basically talking about myself and my uh, journey. So you may have to forgive me some of the obvious egotism that's involved in any such uh, presentation. This is my journey and as there are many roads to, to Rome, um, each one of us can choose a separate path. Uh, but this is uh, what I did. And my first encounter with medicine, my, my family had been educators and scientists and nobody had gone into medicine. And I'm the first one. And I think it had to do with when I was five years old, I contracted uh, tetanus. And at that time, as advanced as my disease was, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion that I would not survive this. And I remember having these uh, tetanic movements and uh, my parents uh, had taken me to the doctor and, and, and during the day, they, the doctor thought maybe this is what it was. And I was to go to the university the next day, but that night, uh, they put me in the chamber right next to their bedroom. I had one of these attacks. I broke my mother's uh, favorite vase and I expected uh, some sort of punishment and instead I got a hug. They put me in their little car and they drove to the university hospital uh, where in the middle of the night, uh, to my eyes, there were, there were white cloaked a uh, giant man that held me down and there was a little sore on my toe uh, from having stepped on a rusty nail, which they cauterized. And then because I was so far gone, instead of putting me in the pediatric ward, they put me in the storage room uh, full of iron lung machines. And to me, these were all giant, uh, giant monsters that surrounded me and my mom uh, crying at a little oval window saying, if he's going to die, let me take him home. But they had a new drug. Um, uh, this was in Germany. And uh, it was called penicillin. And they gave it to me. And naturally, I survived. And so the professor that had treated me uh, became rather renowned within this institution for having saved somebody so far gone with tetanus and brought me to a lecture room. And here I was five years old, I was placed on a little table on the stage and unceremoniously that professor took off my gown to demonstrate the reflexes. Here I was completely naked in front of this big group and my embarrassment exists to this day. And I hope that that embarrassment has somehow made me maybe be a little more empathetic uh, to my own patients. But so this, this, this sort of is what I remembered uh, in my mind. 
but it's penicillin that saved my life. And I was in the hospital for a couple of months. And I'm sure that had something to do with uh, why I went into medicine. Interestingly enough, um, sometime later, uh, Dr. Falbush from Erlangen, the, in, the, the, the uh, university hospital that I went to at five years old, had invited me to give the lecture. And he and the dean of the school presented me with the records of when I was there as a child. I don't know where else you could keep such incredible records to be able to be retrieved. That was a very uh, memorable moment. But back to my uh, journey, I knew I wanted to be a neurosurgeon uh, very early on. And in high school, uh, where, where, where you have a, a yearbook in 1959, I already wrote uh, that I wanted to become a neurosurgeon. Everybody laughed at me, but that's what happened. When I went to college, I did an honors project uh, at, in, a, in a labor state laboratory uh, with flow meters on canine models. And then I went to Northwestern because Paul Busey at that time was the most recognized uh, academic neurosurgeon in the country. And he became a mentor of mine. And uh, he sent me as a medical student to Cryenbuehl and Yasserdil. And then he suggested that I do my residency in San Francisco with Dr. Wilson. And uh, that was uh, um, my, my, my significant other and I moved to uh, San Francisco where later on we got married. And the residency, I, I learned a lot from Dr. Wilson that his dedication, his commitment, his incredible drive, his generosity, my, uh, my uh, later on wife, Nancy, was his neuro-oncology nurse. Uh, that's where I um, initiated and formed the percutaneous lumbar shunt. And during my residency, I had the opportunity uh, to visit Austria and Dr. Kuss and uh, Yasergil. I uh, edited the first book with Kuss and uh, developed the normal perfusion pressure breakthrough theory. So during that rotation, during my residency, uh, there's my wife and uh, Dr. Peter Schmiedek, who unfortunately has passed away. And there's Wolfgang Kuss, a longtime friend who's also passed away. And I was mesmerized by Gassi Yasergil's incredible virtuosic uh, surgical skills. And I try to model myself very much after his uh, demonstration of what could be accomplished. After finishing my residency, I went to Case Western Reserve University that was uh, in Cleveland. It was six years, uh, quite productive. I was able to get an R01 NIH grant met Warren Selman, Dr. Sapramsky, Dr. Rekate. Some of those names may mean something to with you, otherwise uh, not. Uh, I met Nick Hopkins, who is uh, the honored guest this year at the, uh, at the CNS, and Ben Stein, who became a very good friend because we skied all over the world together. But I wanted my own program, and that opportunity came uh, in Cleveland. And there... I was invited by John Green, who was the first director of the uh, uh, Bear Neurological Institute. And Dr. Sontag happened to be in private practice there. So that was in 1983. I brought Dr. Zabramski along, who was a fellow in my laboratory. And I became the Harvard chairman of neurosurgery. John Green was the director. And what were my goals? I was very naive. I was very young. I wanted one coherent neurosurgical group. I believed very strongly in subspecialization. And I wanted to make the residency program the most wanted residency program. And um, obviously to do that, we had to have academic productivity. I initiated at great cost an editorial office to make academic productivity easier. And obviously we established a research laboratory I convinced Dr. Sontag to leave private practice and join me. 
and he took on spine surgery as his goal. Um, and uh, he has been not only an incredible friend, uh, but he obviously changed the world of spine in the United States. There were three professional mentors that I tried to emulate. The first was my chief, that was Charlie Wilson, because he was such a hard worker. He was not an easy person and, and a lot of patients and residents uh, were not that enamored with him, but uh, we got along uh, incredibly well. Um, but his dedication to neurosurgery was legendary. Ghazi Yasser Guild, I already mentioned, surgical virtuosity. And then finally, Charlie Drake. And why Charlie Drake? Um, he was a generous personality. If you were a medical student, a nobody in the medical world, you could sit down with Charlie and have a great conversation and he would give you all the time you wanted. Uh, we established a travel club. Uh, some of these names uh, you may very well recognize. And the beauty of that travel club is really that uh, every year we would get together and we all went through the same professional stages and the family stages, uh, and it was uh, wonderful. We didn't just work, uh, we also played. And we had did a lot of meetings in uh, Europe. Here's Ben Stein, who went to every one of these. We also went heli skiing together. Uh, and we always associated this with these meetings. And these meetings were excellent because you could have discussions. You could tell somebody, oh, you are so full of it. Um, and uh, it was a very informal, but very, very uh, worthwhile educational experience. I took a sabbatical and uh, finished this these volumes with uh, Professor Coos. And obviously this is Dolink, I visited him. Uh, and so on. It was a great time. We had many visitors at the BNI, uh, Charlie Drake, Yasser Gill, um, one of my uh, favorites uh, right there. And then uh, even the Pope came to uh, the BNI, <laughs> the only hospital he visited on his, uh, on his journey. And what did I learn from my mentors? Well, you have to have passion. I think for a neurosurgeon to really be the best that he or she can be is you have to be passionate about your work. You have to have self-control. You have to be a team player. You have to be a mentor. And very often being a mentor, you learn a great deal yourself. You have to read, you have to publish, you have to present if you wanna be an academ academician. And one of my uh, important aspects in a residency program is you have to learn from mistakes. So if we have we have very robust uh, morbidity mortality conference, but the goal of them was not um, to criticize the person, but rather well, what should we have done different? What can we do different next time? And I think that's how we all improve. You share your success but you own failure. Neurosurgery is all about indications, risks, discussion. I've always said exposure is everything. If you can see what you're dealing with, uh, you can deal with it. Uh, all of these things play a role in how well you can do your, uh, your surgery. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because I've, I've, I've talked about them extensively, but this is the way I did it. I sat, I had armrests, I had the microscope that I could move with my mouth. Uh, my, my, my seated position gave me arm and wrists uh, support, and you could have full control over your um, foot pedals. And that's how it looked. Intraoperative image guidance was absolutely essential later on when uh, image guidance uh, uh, became uh, sophisticated and available and through the microscope. And then for the last uh, couple of decades of my career, I used retraction less and less. And, and, and in the publication that we had prospectively recorded how often we used it, 97% of craniotomies uh, I did not use any rigid retraction. And the goal is really, um, when we do this here, we have to move, we have to get enough exposure to see. And, and 
uh, uh, pressure from the retractors definitely uh, causes ischemia. Instead, we use our instruments to give us the retraction. And if you need lighted instruments, so I call that dynamic retraction, you're still retracting. But here you have forceps on the dentate ligament and they're just lightly lifting up. And look at how it affected the blood flow. And just as I lower it, can you see the blood flow come back to normal? So it's just an example of how very little retraction really does affect uh, the portion of the brain or spinal cord that's being retracted. How do we share our experience? Well, you publish, you do atlases, you share videos, etc. What part of the neurosurgeon is really to create solutions? So here's a gentleman that comes into the hospital. He's bleeding from his mouth. Uh, from another hospital when they did a biopsy for a lump that they saw on the back of the throat. They packed it off and shipped them over. So here you have an infected site. You have a, a an aneurysm that's sitting there that's really not accessible directly, feeding off the internal carotid artery. What are you going to do? Well, what we did is we exposed the internal carotid artery in the petrous bone, and then took the internal carotid artery in the neck and we did a bypass extra durally all the way that just went around the lesion. So you see it here, you see basically coming off the internal carotid and then getting into the petrous internal carotid artery. And that eliminated that, uh, uh, that aneurysm. So we reflect, uh, we review, and we contribute. And I, I want to give you a, a few personal examples. When I was a resident, uh, in order to put in a lumbar paired meal shunt, um, there was a full laminectomy. It was a big procedure. And I thought to myself, that is really, really sort of silly. And I was a, uh, I, I observed this and I worked with Rudy Schulte to make a percutaneous insertion of that shunt, both in the abdomen as well as into the back. And I was naive because uh, I, I didn't get a patent on it. I, I thought, well, this is, this is for my patients. I shouldn't be making any money off it. It was pretty, 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 pretty naive, uh, but it's, it's been used in thousands and thousands of cases. Another small innovation that I really liked was to take these, uh, this little malleable, it has a wire in it, a suction device that you could do put right next to when you're doing bypass, for example, and it just uh, sucks away the CSF or, or a little bit of blood, uh, giving it uh, a nice, clear operative field. This is one of my favorite ones. Uh, my brother was a scientist studying moon rocks, and he was a chairman of uh, geophysics uh, of the Colorado University. And he used a technique called holographic inter interferometry, which is basically taking a holographic picture, then putting any sort of stress on what you're taking a picture of, like a rock or anything else, and then seeing the deformation line by taking another holographic picture. So these lines are all displacement lines and it can be as easily as putting a penny on top of the skull and seeing the deformation line and that would predict failure. So uh, for this particular stress, you'd expect the failure to be here. And I thought, well, if you take the diastolic and, and uh, pulse and you see, see the variations and the stress is just created from the heartbeat, you might be able to determine where there would be tumors inside. Well, naturally along came beautiful MRI and CT making this whole thing, <laughs> uh, nothing more than of historical uh, interest. In the laboratory, uh, what we developed, what I developed here is this little device, which is, this here is a little balloon that inflates by pushing down on this reservoir and this was implanted on primate uh, trans, transorbitally so that you could press down on the skull and the middle cerebral artery would occlude. And so you could have uh, an, an animal that was awake 
Um, and fortuitously, and that led to uh, the NIH grant, fortuitously in Cleveland, there was Ohio Nuclear, one of the early companies that was producing MRI scans. So we took the model and this is the very first MRI scan of a stroke. And this was in with less than 30 minutes of occlusion. CT, you wouldn't be able to see it, nothing else. So here you have an example of an MRI scan of the middle cerebral artery occlusion being already positive. And at the time, uh, that was truly uh, very significant. The other thing that we really need to do as neurosurgeons or as any physician is to listen. So this was a patient of my predecessor, Dr. Greens, that I inherited. And he was talking about suicide because he had lost the sense of smell and taste after the removal of a meningioma, a, a, sub, a frontal meningioma. And so I was thinking, are there ways of preserving olfaction for lesions like this? Because when you think about it, yes, the smell of coffee, of perfume, of flowers, these are all things that enhance our existence. So if you have this kind of a tumor, which was a uh, angiofibroma in a young man, and you can see how it affects the cribriform plate here, the uh, natural order of things would be just to cut all of that out. So what we did instead here is did a cribriform osteotomy. So the cribriform plate is still attached here. And here is the craniotomy above the orbits, getting that out. And so here is the cribriform plate. That's this here, right here, still attached to the dura. We had no idea whether that would preserve olfaction or not. Um, but then we took the tumor out. Uh, then uh, closed everything back up. Here's the cribriform plate going back in. Uh, here he is afterwards. Tumor is completely gone. And lo and behold, at six weeks after surgery, he had olfaction. And we did this repeatedly. And so we... we, uh, we uh, uh, published four patients who underwent this uh, approach and within eight weeks of olfaction had returned in all four patients. Basically just listening uh, to the patient. Um, this is important for me because I think in many ways uh, we have gone sort of too far off the beaten path in the treatment of aneurysms. So I'm gonna just spend a few minutes talking about uh, endovascular and clipping of aneurysms. And the question has always been, is coiling superior? And there have been five prospective studies. ISAT was positive at one year, but not at five and 10 years, except for death, which I'll talk. For Brad, there was no difference at any time point. For, at, in the Finnish study, there was no difference. In the Lee study, there was no difference. And in this year's publication of can the Canadian study, it favored clipping. And here are the concerns really, patient selecting, durability, rebleeding, coil migration, treatment morbidity, and mortality. Well, if you compare, I said you required equipoise. In Brad, all non-traumatic uh, patients were entered. There, there, there were no, uh, no exclusions. Only 22% of eligible patients were entered in ISAD. All of the patients diagnosed with non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage were entered in BRAD. 97% anterior circulation, 94% anterior circulation. 78% of their patients were graded one and two. 53% of patients were only one and two because we took all comers. They had a 15 hour delay for clipping as compared to coiling. And that in itself, before treatment was initiated, had 11 more subarachnoid hemorrhages and 12 deaths before treatment. 
we had six death. We, the goal was all to treat within 24 hours. We had six death before treatment, three in each cohort because they were all treated promptly. Coiled retreatment was about the same, but that's a significant number. Almost a fifth of the patient required retreatment. Modified rank and score, 31% clip, 24% coil. Uh, that was in year one. For, for Brad, there was no difference at any time point. Modified rank and score after one year, there was no difference, none at any time point. Death at 10 years, they decided to look at death and the clips had more death than coils. And I'll, I'll discuss that. And death at 10 years, there was absolutely no difference between the two cohorts. What we need to remember is that even in ISAT, if you looked at <clears throat> re-bleeding, <clears throat> re-bleeding was higher, significantly higher than clipping. You've also got to remember that in ISAT, there had to be no, you did not have to document post-operatively whether you had good clipping or not. So for Brad, we had, uh, I'm going to go very quickly, 362, six died, as I mentioned, three in each group. They were assigned. So it, it, it was just like I said, it was an intent to treat trial. That means they were randomized. And once they were randomized, they were in your group. If you didn't treat them at all, they were still within your group uh, for statistical analysis. So 356 were treated. Of 178 that were COIL assigned, 36% were crossed over by the endovascular surgeon to clipping. Of those assigned to clipping, only one was crossed over to coiling. So less than 1% versus 36%. So it ended up, ended up that 241 were clipped and 115 were coiled. And actually, for example, if you had a big hematoma in, and was assigned to uh, uh, coiling, it was appropriately crossed over. And that group of with hematomas did poorly uh, for their entire follow-up through 10 years. When you looked at when you looked at the outcome in Brad, there was no difference at any time point between clip coil assigned and clip assigned. Uh, what the CF stands for is, is uh, carry forward. So that means that if a patient was seen at 10 years uh, or was not seen at 10 years, but they were seen at six years, then the last exam was carried forward. If we look at anterior circulation, which is really the best comparison because uh, I said was almost exclusively anterior circulation, we can see anatomically there was good parity between the various locations. And now if we look at coil assigned and clip assigned, again, there was no different. And uh, the only thing you notice that those were coiled assigned actually did, did worse than those were that were clip assigned, um, but did not reach statistical significance. And there was absolutely no difference in death between the two cohorts assigned to clipping and coiling. Now let's look at actual treatment. Remember that 36% of those that were assigned to the coiling cohort were actually clipped. So only 99 were coiled and 215 were clipped. So despite the fact that those with big hematomas who did poorly all the way through 10 years and were crossed over to clipping, the clipping had a slightly better outcome uh, than the coiling obviously not of statistical significance. And if you looked at death, there were actually more death in the remaining uh, coiled group as opposed to clip group, whether it was 10 years or 10 years carry forward, but obviously did not reach significant. But why are we treating in the first place? Well, we're treating so that they're cured. However, at 10 years, almost 20% 
of patients that required, required retreatment, as opposed to significantly less than 1% uh, for clipping. Complete aneurysm of, uh, treatment, obliteration, adjudicated by a neuroradiologist not involved in the study. At 10 years, uh, only a little over a fifth of the patient in the call group uh, had uh, complete aneurysm obliteration, as opposed to more than 90% in the CLIP group. And then finally, the whole goal is to prevent re-bleeding. There were only two re-bleeds, and out of 83, um, at 10 years, two had died from a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which was significant in all three nights. That is why we are treating aneurysms, to prevent this calamity. Just remember that this happened at eight and nine years after treatment. I'm going to get back to that. Beautifully obliterated, uh, but then died from a recurrent subarachnoid hemorrhage of that aneurysm. And it's not just uh, a coiling. Here is one um, that was uh, treated uh, with a stent, uh, had actually ended up getting seven pipeline stents put in into this young lad. And, and his vision was just disappearing left and right. Looks, looks quite good on the initial portion of the angiogram, seven stents going all the way up the middle cerebral artery. But this is what was happening. There was progressive extrusion of blood into the hematoma, into, into the aneurysm. And that's why the patient, he had no light perception in one eye and a temporal hemifield in the other. And that's because this was happening. So he was referred to us and here's an operation. You can see the stents inside the carotid artery. What we ended up doing was uh, performing a bypass, obviously, and uh, excluding the carotid, the carotid artery there. And it's pretty straightforward. This is from the facial artery, uh, which is a great donor. And so what you see post-op, here's the mass. It's no longer lighting up. There was no change in the visual field. Here's the bypass coming in. But three months post-operative, the mass has disappeared and the child has had in, in dramatic improvement uh, of his vision. There are also many an aneurysms that are just not appropriate for endovascular treatment. And so here you had a subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage. A uh, patient uh, had an angiogram. And the question is, do you repeat the angiogram before discharge? Do you repeat it in one year or do you do an MRI C CTA in one year? Um, our, our policy was always to repeat it again. And so when we repeated it, we found a little dissecting aneurysm of the basilar artery. It can't be stented. It shouldn't be observed. So it had to be clipped. And here we go. So we're opening the cisterns going right down to the basilar artery. We're taking the PCOM where there aren't any perforators. And I used to clip them, but now cutting them means there's no clip in the way. And then very generally, here's the basilar artery, SCA, third nerve on the contralateral side, PCA on the other side, PCA on this side, SCA on the other side. And there's the aneurysm sitting right on top. Mammillary bodies hanging down, no retractor in place. So now we're freeing up, being very careful not to put any stretch. I like to put a little cotton on it and then putting quite a bit of pressure down toward the basilar artery, clipping the lesion. And then what we obviously have to be absolutely certain of is that we don't catch any perforators. Uh, this was sort of small, so you can see the thalamal perforators off to the side. We went around it, checked it everywhere. And nothing is worse than not checking to make sure you don't have a perforator. 
even though you want to be done, you want to be absolutely certain it's gone. Here it's gone. And beautiful angiogram. You can have aneurysms uh, like this here. Um, this is uh, tough. It's an ACOM. It looks like it's uh, perfectly reasonable for endovascular, but actually it's this size of an aneurysm. And if you put coils in there, it will be, it, it will grow right back again. You can see the size. You can see why the patient was symptomatic. So we did a left OC because there was also a left middle cerebral artery, incidental aneurysm. Here it is, no retractor, just slight retraction with your instrument and then taking things out. And then uh, by having access, we cut the dome of the aneurysm away, like a, like a napkin ring is left. And then with multiple clips, closed off the, uh, the aneurysm itself. And because we have ICG intraoperatively, we can make sure that we did not occlude the parent vessel. And this was what we ended up with. There is the shell of the aneurysm that's still behind uh, so that you don't disrupt more brain. Difficult aneurysm, here's a P2, P3 aneurysm. The question is, do you observe this or stent? It's one that has been growing, so we were treating it. Then the question is, how do you approach it? And this is how we approached it. A lateral supracerebellar infratentorial approach. So here we're coming down, we're along the tent. This is the tentorium right here. You can see the thickened arachnoid. And what had happened is really that this aneurysm was related to the tentorium, which surely played a role in its growth, cutting the tentorium, shrinking it back with the bipolars, and then keep opening the arachnoid space, uh, PCA proximal here, distal here, And here we see the aneurysm. So here, here's proximal, here's distal, here's the aneurysm. Here's a branch off the aneurysm, not very big, but it's sitting right on top of the aneurysm. So we're freeing it up completely. So we have full mobility of the aneurysm. We have good control. Notice there is no retractor in place. This patient is in a park bench position and I'm just operating over the cerebellum, tentorium. And now we're separating that little branch enough so I can put a tine between it and the aneurysm. And once we have enough room there, then we can go ahead and slip in the, the clip. It has to be loose enough to allow uh, the clip to be placed. And there is the clip going in. And now we look at the little branch and we see it's compromised. That clip compromised it. So we move the clip up to make sure that branch does get a chance to fill. And once it's filled, we add on an extra little clip to get rid of that little nubbin. And you can see very nicely that that branch fills. And there's the post stop. This is one, another one. Here's the aneurysm, subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's off of ICA, but it's not one that is really suitable uh, for endovascular treatment. So here we're going to use just a simple retrosigmoid approach, no retractor in place. We're looking down at the base of the clivus. This is ICA. Saw the sixth nerve there briefly, seven and eight. Basilar artery right here. There is the trunk of Ike as it comes off. So now we need to open up between the aneurysm and the brain stem in order to be able to put our clip safely at the neck of the aneurysm. And that's somewhat tough because this aneurysm has eroded into this space of the brain stem. And so you really have to use sharp dissection to create space for your time. 
And then once we have that, you see we're getting closer and closer to the other side. Here's the sixth cranial nerve hanging in the breeze. And then finally we get to the point where we're separating. Now we can see the other side for the first time. And once we have that available, then we can place our clip safely and occlude the aneurysm. And be sure that ICG still fills the vessels that we want to remain. And here you see the clip and the post-op. Sorry. Uh, here's one that's, uh, that's a little more complex. Again, not appropriate for endovascular treatment. Middle cerebral artery aneurysm. And the problem here is that the outflow vessels came off the dome of the aneurysm. Not very common, but it does happen. So here is the feeding vessel, a retractor to expose the distal portion of the middle cerebral artery. And so there wasn't really much choice. Here's a distal vessel coming out, a clip on it. Proximal, we're shutting off. So there were three vessels coming out of the aneurysm. In order to give us room, we took out the entire aneurysm. Then we took the A, the, the M2, and we sewed it to two branches. So this proximal middle cerebral artery fed two distal branches of the middle cerebral artery, and then did a direct STA to SCA bypass to the third branch. So you can see they're open. And then we did a direct bypass here. And this is basically what we did. And here you see it post-op. Here is uh, uh, the absence. And here is the middle cerebral artery. And here is the, uh, the, the feeder. Here's the middle cerebral artery feeding those two branches. And here's the STA for the other branch. I like this case because I have a long follow-up. This was a 14-year-old with the largest aneurysm I saw. And you can see it's shifted way over from, right, uh, from left uh, to right. It's a left-sided aneurysm. And then you have this channel going through the clot and coming out and feeding the left hemisphere. Only two branches, which is good. So we used both branches of the STA to maintain flow into that left hemisphere. And then proximally, we took out a little bit of volume, but here's the middle cerebral artery coming up. These are the lenticular strides. So we were able to preserve them and clip right here. Post-op, this is, post-op is what you saw here. Here's the feeding of the middle cerebral artery, the, those lenticular stride branches. And here's the STA feeding the two branches of the middle cerebral artery. And he had his, his neurological exam was unchanged. And here's the follow-up. This is what it was in 91. This it was in 2004. And he remained perfectly normal. This is what it was in 91. And look how nicely it has evolved into what looks like almost a perfectly normal uh, middle cerebral artery. Last two more cases. This is again, this is an 18 month old with this hemorrhage and had this dissecting aneurysm of A2. There's no endovascular option. Again, no retractor, proximal, and you can see it fall apart and this hole being an A2. So I took the frontopolar branch on the opposite side, which is well tolerated, and used it to patch the hole and create another bypass in case it would occlude, but everything stayed open. So this is remained open afterwards. Patient was just fine. So this is what we did. Took the frontal polar on the other side, used it to patch it and add an additional bypass. And here she is. And five years later, normal angiogram. 
best reader in a class. But what is the problem with all the studies that we have done with natural history of aneurysms? The problem is we are very good endovascularly or with clipping to make aneurysms small. Small aneurysms bleed much, much less than large aneurysms. But when they're not completely occluded, they grow. And so as years go by, remember the other the, the patients in Brad that bled were at eight and nine years. In the Finnish study, they were in the same uh, same time period. So anything that you 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 look at here, say five years, you you can say coiling is just as good as clipping and obliterating aneurysms, but it's a lifelong disease. We need to look at it longer. Subarachnoid risk is directly related to aneurysm size. Residual aneurysm is small after treatment. Risk over time increases as it grows. Aneurysm closure favors clipping. Both Finnish and Brad had their first events more than six years after treatment. All studies with short follow-up fail to address this concern. Ideally, the follow-up should extend to 20 years. That's asking a lot. We should get late Brad follow-up and uh, Dr. Lawton is uh, considering this. The other big elephant in the room, there is an enormous evidence that when you have industry support for studies, uh, there is a significant impact on studies and results. Outside of the studies that I've mentioned, those few prospective studies, every other study that has been industry supported has compared it to another um, already established industry study as to efficacy and uh, risks. That is not okay. And so these, these, these for the middle cerebral artery aneurysms, for example, uh, comparing studies like that, uh, it, 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 it's just not right. We've got to remember that at 10 years, actual clipped cohort had no subarachnoid hemorrhage, retreatment less than 1%, and complete occlusion of 93%. And yet, none of these studies compare that to those results. So is aneurysm clipping dead? No. Brad, 36% crossed over. No difference in morbidity and mortality in Brad at any time. Risk of rebleeding retreatment and obliteration favor clipping. Problem with treatment studies is that they do not take into consideration growth of residuals, which is time dependent. So I wanna show you uh, uh, one last case. Uh, this is a, a, a six year old. Um, he had previous surgery, 16 hours, severe blood loss, no <laughs> diagnosis. Uh, this was back in another country, and uh, they had to stop because of extensive blood loss. He was then treated uh, in Houston with embolization with no result. And what this is, is this is a cavernous malformation of the transverse sinus. Cavernous malformations in sinuses are totally different as their vascularity is concerned. Much, much more vascular. This is what the lesion looked like. Uh, you can see that the transfer sinus over here is occluded. Dr. Albuquerque was able to find this one little vessel from an external feeder and put in about two Mercedes cars worth of uh, onyx into this lesion. And then we enlarged the craniotomy. We went across the sinus on either side so I don't know whether we needed embolization. And then we had this big mass that was easily uh, resected. And you can see it, the sparking that occurs with the, uh, when we use the cautery because of the onyx that's in it. Uh, watch, watch the sparking here. Let's see the sparking. And, and we take it out. Nothing much good. Much easier than it should have been. And here he is. Uh, his Italian mom was there. Um, and I was disappointed that she kissed him instead of me since I did all the work. But the nice thing is 
uh, here is one year afterwards. He's he's a great soccer player, and here is nine year follow up. You can see uh, no reset, no recurrence, and just a shift of the fourth ventricle, and he was perfectly normal. I got a, a plaque from one of the residents, Dr. Hadley, in 1985, who said, here is Dr. Spetzler's philosophy, and it's never put off till tomorrow what you can have a resident do today. So conclusions, we stand on the shoulder of our mentors, we pay forward by being mentors, Technical excellence is based on practice, analysis, and continuous learning. Uh, the evolution of an institute, it's so self-obvious, I'm not going to. What is important is owning failures. If there's a mistake made, you're the captain of the ship. It's your fault. Whether it was the resident or a nurse or an anesthesiologist uh, that made a mistake, it is your fault. And when you have success, you share it with everybody. But learning from mistakes and teaching others to avoid them is how we improve patient outcome. And finally, we owe it to our patients, our specialty in ourselves to be the very best we can be. My personal neurosurgical journal has exceeded every expectation I had, and I remain convinced neurosurgery is the best specialty there is. So enjoy your own surgery. What is the <clears throat> ultimate reward? These were all my residents or fellows uh, we had over 200 of them, and then we had hundreds and hundreds of uh, foreign visitors. Uh, don't forget to live in all of this time. Um, I, I believe very much uh, that uh, you've got to balance, have a balanced life. And and and, but I was big into biking and sailing, crossed the Grand Canyon 34 times. Um, a lot of bike races, uh, a lot of skiing, heli skiing, uh, always with my wife. Uh, this is my last operation, um, number 6,495. And I always had people watching over my shoulder. So it was never, it was never a particular big thing. So this was after my last operation. I was so surprised. I got all this and it, it was very touching. And then we took the elevator down and here the, the entire staff of the hospital and, and visitors and uh, old patients. Uh, and I thought, oh my God, what am I doing? And I kept going and it just continued. I walked around the corner and there was more. It was very touching, almost brought tears to my eyes. Uh, very, very sweet. So... I just want to say that a, a neurosurgery is a great, great field, and we owe it to our patient to do our very best. And I would do exactly the same thing if I had the opportunity over. I thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much, dear professor, for this uh, nice and motivating uh, lecture with very many tough cases. I think. Uh, People will discuss it uh, soon, and uh, as we uh, see here, Andre. Before that, uh, as I said, as we said, I uh, paste the uh, web page forms uh, for our question, and if you uh, click on the link, the form will open, and then you will write your uh, answers. First name, surname, email, country, and then we are five chooses question, one question, and you will choose the right answer. And you will earn Dr. Spacer's book with uh, your name. Okay, please go on. Yeah, the. Uh... Comment and question from Tami Ogai. Thank you for this incredibly insightful and informative lecture. I would like to ask among site embolization, would you also use adenosine induced flow of arrest to reduce perfusion when treating any reasons? Additionally, I am going into my second year of medical school and would appreciate some advice on getting into publishing and research during my time. 
Thank you again, and I look forward to potentially meeting and listening to you again. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, we, we published the largest uh, cardiac standstill series of patients, um, 106 patients, I believe, where the heart was stopped completely and patients were placed on a pump for giant complex basilar artery aneurysms. Um, it was a, a very uh, intensive uh, procedure a very effective, but it had a morbidity mortality of uh, close to 30%. But these were all, there, were, there weren't any other alternatives for these patients, and it's very effective. But now what adenosine does, it gives you a very brief period of time of uh, treating something where you're really worried about rupture or where you're actually ruptured and you need a little extra time. So yes, by all means, use that. Also, pacing, cardiac pacing is another way to really control uh, uh, this uh, particular problem. As far as getting into a neurosurgery program, um, I always say the number one requirement is you have to have passion. You have to be passionate about wanting to make this your life's work. When that requirement is met, then you can get help by spending time in a neurosurgical laboratory or any other sort of laboratory and doing some research and getting a publication out of it by watching other neurosurgeons and getting to know them so you can have letters of reference and by always treating others appropriately. For example, we never take a resident uh, if we hear from one of the nurses or from a secretary uh, that they were rude during their interview process. Thank you, thank you very much. Next uh, message is, I can find uh, Denise Bellen. Uh, I can't find a word to express our thanks. You are an amazing mentor to all neurosurgeons in the world. Yeah, it's true. Okay. Uh, I have a question if I may. <laughs> Uh, yeah, please, yes, yes, of course. Uh, first of all, I'm starstruck and I almost forgot everything I wanted to ask. Uh, while watching your uh, operation and technique, uh, my, I was holding a breath and my heart skipped several bits. So thank you for sharing your experience and sharing your amazing cases. And uh, what I wanted to, to ask, like uh, we live in the emergence, uh, emerging era of endovascular surgery, and there's a term like hybrid neurosurgeon. And for a, a young neurosurgeon, I'm wondering what will be your personal advice? Should we pursue both open surgery, of open vascular and endovascular, or should we master one of them? <laughs> so what would be your advice? Yeah, I, it, I get asked this question all the time. And because we have a strong, such a strong endovascular um, presence at the BNI, uh, many of our chief residents ended up um, becoming hybrid neurosurgeons. And my advice is that if you're at a large institution, it's best to really subspecialize in one or the other. If you are in a smaller institution where the volume is not high enough, being a hybrid neurosurgeon is just fine. It's very difficult to really make significant contributions if you try to do everything. And so subspecialization uh, is very good. I am very much against the um, endovascular specialists that sit in small hospitals without adequate neurosurgical presence. Um, there are just too many cases that really require both expertise, but I have tremendous respect for endovascular surgeons. My, my very, very good friend, Dr. Hopkins, who's the honored guest of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons uh, this next month and who I will be introducing, um, can be credited with bringing endovascular back into neurosurgery where it really belongs. Thank you so much for your response. And thank you. Uh, I'm sure a lot of students, a lot of uh, residents gonna watch the recording of the lecture and will be inspired. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Uh, Mariam, uh, 
last year a medical student from Georgia want to ask her question by speaking out. So, Marianne. Thank you, uh, first of all, uh, Professor, for your great uh, presentation of the lecture. It was really so interesting. And this is really big pleasure for me as a medical student, uh, which is uh, interested in neurosurgery and neurosciences to attend such kind of interesting lecture. I'm interested in one thing. You know that cavernous and cavernous malformations are really big issue for the world. So I'm interested in uh, what is your practice with uh, working on cavernomas, asymptomatic cavernomas, I mean, uh, how often you advise, uh, for example, uh, people who have the genetic and historical, um, how can I say, uh, addiction to that cavernomas? Uh, do you uh, advise them to make the genetic analysis and when they, for, for example, child will be born, to have uh, all of the pictures, what will be needed to diagnose the cavernomas, and uh, what you think uh, can world make uh, really good programs about the cavernomas? Because in Georgia, uh, really, um, some of the people are dying because of asymptomatic cavernomas because they didn't know that they had it, and this is really so pity that in such kind of 21st century people are dying with cavernomas what is approach uh, what is the approach your approach you use during that time thanks uh, mariami that is a very sophisticated question from a medical student uh, good for you the uh, i i've grown up with cavernous malformations we identified them they used to be published as as rhombosed arterial venous malformations uh, we've, we've, we've published so much on cavernous malformation, written so many books. Uh, they are unique lesions, and for neurosurgery, they have been eye-openers because they respect no boundaries. They occur anywhere. Brainstem, I just showed you one in the, uh, in the, uh, in the sinus, and when they're in, in, in a sinus, they're totally different as far as vascular blood supply is concerned. And they come, I, I consider them like a phacomytosis, very much like uh, von Hippel-Lindau disease, the hemangioblastomas. Hemangioblastomas have three cell lines. They occur sporadically and they occur familial. Cavernous malformation have only one cell line, the endothelial uh, cell. They occur sporadically and they occur familially. When they occur sporadically and there's only a single lesion and it's symptomatic or it's growing or it's accessible, it's very easy to make a recommendation of treatment. When they're in a fat familial pattern where you can have many different cavernous malformation, the philosophy is uh, we follow them. Uh, we have a nice publication that Dr. Sabramski headed in which he showed 6% growth every year in familial cavernous malformation. So they're not benign, but you can't take them all out unless um, it's very unique. So what do you take out? You take out the ones that are grown and ready to cause a problem, the ones that have bled and are causing a problem. So you discern, and by following them, these uh, family members really do remarkably well over their lifetime. Thank you. Okay, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the message uh, from Edwin Vasvi, Bulgaria. You still look very young and full of energy, sir. Your passion in neurosurgery is very contagious. I wish uh, all of us could touch mentors like you. You met this world much better place, so thank you. Uh, thank you for message. And next message uh, from Nana from Georgia. Many thanks for your wonderful lecture about your fascinating journey. Jenny, I was wondering, do you think there are any particular research areas or unanswered questions in cerebrovascular neurosurgery that you believe need further exploration in the next few years? Um, th that, that's a, that's a, that's a uh, multifaceted question because cerebrovascular surgery and all of neurosurgery it's so broad. I mean, what a specialty we have. We have functional neurosurgery. We have implants to make arms move. We have robotic uh, neurosurgery. 
Uh, we have research into, into uh, cellular mechanisms, mitochondrial disease. I think what you need to do is you need to find a mentor who has a particular interest that you uh, can sympathize with, something that excites you, and then join that individual and further uh, further the, uh, the, the knowledge within neurosurgery. Thank you. Uh, next message from uh, Alfan Ahmad. Thank you so much for sharing your life experience, doctor. Smile, thank you. Um, Dr. Ibrahimov. Uh, hi, dear professor. My name is Nabila from Uzbekistan. Now I am in Tokyo, Japan. I have been learning about skull by surgery with Professor Michihiro Kono. Thanks a lot for your presentation. It was great. My question is, what do you think, Professor, would, what field of neurosurgery should be developed? Thank you for answering. Yeah. I think all the fields in neurosurgery need to be uh, developed. I, 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 I think I could get excited about every one of the fields. One of my, one of my brightest uh, young um, medical students and then resident uh, who really collected the cardiac standstill group and published it, came into my office uh, maybe in the second year of residency, he says, hey, boss, you know, um, I don't think I'm going to become a cerebrovascular neurosurgeon, even though that's what all his research was, that's what he had intended to do, and he became our functional neurosurgeon and made great comp contributions. He, he found that his interests lay there. And uh, I was not in the least disappointed because I think functional neurosurgery has an incredibly bright future. And we're just touching on the potential that is uh, available there. Thank you. Next message, uh, Hakan Karabajir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Spetzler, wonderful cases and experiences. We appreciate you for sharing. And Mehmet uh, Salih. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I see no further messages. Okay. Uh, you see any? Uh, and then, uh, I think we finished all the uh, questions and comments and thanks. Now uh, the turn is the answer of the question. Uh, we asked. The question, who was the first director of Faro Neurological Institute? The uh, was A, Walter Walker Zontak, uh, Walter Dandy, Robert Spessler, John Green, Al Roton. And Professor Spessler, what was the correct answer? Uh, it was obviously John Green. John and I Green. mentioned him very specifically during my presentation. Yeah. And uh, let me see. There are 21 uh, answers. Wow. And 71.4% uh, choose the right answer, John Green. And, How many? 71.4%. Uh, uh, made the correct answer. There are one uh, answer from Algeria, one answer from Bulgaria, four answers from Georgia, one answer from United Kingdom, and the rest are from Turkey. Turkey. And the winner is, uh, please answer uh, colleagues, uh, turn on their microphones, microphones and uh, camera. So, I will. So, Hamil, we have one more question in the chat. Okay. Uh, from uh, Ferol Benu, uh, resident in Dakar. I am very happy to be here to learn about uh, from your professor. Thanks a lot. My question is how advice you have for young African African neurosurgeon who are interested in neurovascular working conditions are very difficult in a lot of countries. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, you know, uh, um, depending on the country, neurosurgery is truly a luxury. I mean, the most important of neurosurgery in a country first is tra trauma, and then only to get to the various subspecialties. Now, the Bear Neurological Institute has an uh, a global outreach program. It's called the uh, the Frankie Global um, um, Outreach Program. We have a, a big presence in Tanzania, and we have permanent presence there. We have rotating um, residents and teachers, and we are integrating with the local neurosurgeons uh, for a teaching program. So if they're really interested, they might consider inquiring about that and seeing if uh, they can get ahead. But yeah, and, you know, it, it all depends on the wealth of a nation, whether they can afford, uh, for example, functional neurosurgery or whether they can afford setups that uh, could do something like a cardiac standstill. I think uh, water supply, getting rid of uh, communicable diseases, et cetera, all, all take precedence over, over, over us. Hassan, are we done? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. There are many uh, correct answers, but uh, there is one uh, winner, and Shilp Mahmoud Shahan. <laughs> he is a medical student from Turkey. Shilp Mahmoud, you can turn on your microphone. Okay. And I'd uh, like to give us a speech, short. <laughs> actually, uh, today, I just get my graduation papers, like I finished med school and okay. I'm happy like that I am honored to get the book. Okay. I wasn't expecting that and you you were quick. I'm speechless. <laughs> it was the first one. Okay, Professor Spencer, please can you sign uh, for Shumar? With, with Hassan, would you? Be kind enough to send me uh, Erhan's, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, Sahan's uh, email, name? his okay, address will, and name. Yes, so I, I can will, do it. I will uh, put the chat part now. Or Dr. Sahan, you can send it to me directly. Uh, My email is very easy. Okay. It's Robert dot Spetzler. I, I will write down uh, now. At BNA, Bear Neurological, Bear Neurological, okay. no, BNA Neuro dot net. Okay. And I, will, and I will get it out to you. Okay. Thank you also, very much. Also, I will write down here. So, I have this one, Robert Spester at barrowbrainandspine.com. Oh, that's fine too. Barrowbrainandspine.com. Okay. Uh, Dif two uh, different uh, apps. Shumamet. Okay, uh, I'm going to. Email to Professor Spester and Professor okay. Spester will send the book. Sign. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I'm very speechless. I can't speak, right? Okay, how many, how many days you have graduated from medical school? I actually today I get my today. graduation papers and I wanted to make some plans for the future in neurosurgery and yeah. Okay, yes. so you have been a doctor for one day. Just. Actually, yes. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I, I wish you the very best. I want to thank you all for your attention. And Hassan, thank you for organizing this. Thank you so much. I yeah. want to thank you one more time, Professor Spester. It was a great lecture, great talk. And I will uh, put on uh, our YouTube channel. And I think many people will watch from YouTube. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today from many countries as I saw. Thank you so much. You're thank welcome. You very much. Bye -bye. And thank you for your moderating. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye.